Chapter 2 The Leading of the Holy Spirit The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. John 3, 8 The Leading of the Holy Spirit the purpose of this book is to provide readers with a framework for understanding the Holy Spirit. Once this framework has been established, readers themselves can build on it further. Developing the framework is like a growing tree. New branches do not replace the old ones. Rather, the new branches stem from the old ones as the tree grows and develops. Knowing the Holy Spirit is similar. We first develop a firm foundation for our understanding of the Holy Spirit. Then we build on that foundation as we acquire new knowledge about the Holy Spirit. As we build on the foundation, the question that needs to be answered is this, are we following our own mind or the leading of the Holy Spirit? This chapter explores the tension and the decision in the heart of every believer as he wrestles with himself to follow the direction of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit and the Pastoral Ministry. What Jesus taught is the only firm foundation for a proper understanding of the Holy Spirit. Jesus emphasizes that we should not oppose or blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Obeying the Holy Spirit is essential not only for our spiritual lives, but also for success in the pastoral ministry. Every Christian is called to be in a church and under the leadership of a pastor. When the church breaks apart, it affects the spiritual community and the individuals in it. God has anointed pastors to shepherd the flock, which is the church, Acts 20, 28. The Holy Spirit leads the church through the pastors that he has ordained. Thus, if the pastors rely on the Holy Spirit, their churches will flourish in the way the Holy Spirit desires. How the pastor should depend and follow the Holy Spirit can be the model for how anyone should follow the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is concerned with raising a church, his interaction with the pastor is very important to understand. Relying and following the Holy Spirit is not as easy as it sounds. Pastors encounter so many difficulties in their work that sometimes they are guided by concerns rather than the Holy Spirit. They often cannot tell whether they are actually praying or just worrying. Worrying cannot develop the faith to receive answer to prayers. Praying by the Holy Spirit develops the faith to be bold because they have completely trusted in God in all situations. A pastor is one person who has earned the trust of his church members. Though their trust is important, he cannot compromise his ability to discern the leading of the Holy Spirit. Many times, what the Holy Spirit wants through the Word of God will conflict with the ideas of the members. When the pastor sides with what God wants, some members will be displeased. They might even complain directly to the pastor and cause him much grief. They do not realize that pastor carries the most burdens when it comes to the church. There may be many workers in the church, but the role of a pastor can hardly be replaced. He carries the burden of the entire ministry as one who must give an account to God at the end. Every day a pastor is as nervous as a new army recruit or a newly wed bride first learning her household chores under her mother-in-law's scrutiny. There is a Korean saying, the mother of the bride, concerned about her daughter, would rather become the bride herself on the wedding day. The pastor so is so concerned with the church that he does not hand over his burdens to others. Obedience to God does not necessarily mean that everybody will be happy. Though he follows the leading of the Holy Spirit, the pastor can still clash with some members and be accused of being a tyrant. However, the church has to acknowledge that Jesus clearly entrusted his sheep to the pastor. As much as a sheep cannot lead the shepherd to green pastures, the church members cannot instruct their pastor. Yet today, many people do not understand the shepherd-sheep relationship, but instead consider the church as a business. Thus, they say that the church should be not be managed by the pastor alone, but by a board or a committee. Some insist that a church should organize a budget and be managed like a business. However, such an operation, operational method may trigger the moral downfall of the pastor and lead to financial loss for the church. I have seen many cases where pastors aimlessly poured money into unnecessary areas just to fulfill a previously agreed upon budget plan. The Lord desires a church where the priority is placed on the pastor's obedience to the Holy Spirit and the members trust in their pastor. 
What is reasonable or practical in the business world does not necessarily apply in the church. As the church grows, a pastor encounters many difficulties. While he strives to rely on the Holy Spirit, some members try to tempt the pastor into just managing the church. If he succumbs to the pressures and separates the Holy Spirit from his work, God will not entrust new souls to the church. The size of the church will then gradually shrink. On the other hand, if the pastor insists on relying on the Holy Spirit, though the disgruntled members may leave, God will bring in more dedicated members. God has entrusted pastoral work to overseers, Acts 20, 28. The ministry is at times like a spiritual combat. It requires different strategies. The overseer from time to time may need to quietly initiate discreet operations. Even Joshua had to send spies secretly to check out Jericho before conquering the land. This operation was not known to all the Israelites to agree upon. Even Jesus did not reveal himself to anyone before it was the right time. Instead, he quietly went about and completed his work. John 7, 6 If people knew that he was the Son of God, they would not have killed him. Then God's plan could not have been accomplished. Similarly, there are times when the pastor needs to deal with some matters quietly. However, there are no secrets between the Holy Spirit and the pastor. None of us should have secrets with the Holy Spirit where we do things without consulting and depending on Him. Since the Holy Spirit is the one who positioned the pastor to lead the body of Christ, all the more pastoral duties in the Holy Spirit are inseparable. If the pastor ignores the Holy Spirit, his work will not be successful. He must rely on the Holy Spirit, pray by the Spirit, and consult the Holy Spirit on all issues. However, some church members request that the pastor to consult with them on different issues. No doubt, the pastor should always take the concerns of his members into consideration. Yet, if he only follows the member's advice, then the pastor will lose the guidance of the Holy Spirit regarding the ministry. The Holy Spirit and the Laity The church will always have people at different levels of faith. Some will definitely see the five loaves feeding the five thousand. Others will not be able to get let go of their calculations. They will think that the five loaves will not even be enough for one person. Feeding the 5,000 would be a dream for them. Faithless, or lacking in faith, people in the church can bring great opposition to the pastors. Even the basic matters of the church will be halted without progress. On the other hand, faithful, or full of faith, people in the church can be encouraged can even encourage the pastor to have a can-do attitude to push forward with anything. For example, if the pastor brings up a request to pray for the construction site of a new building, faithful people would be making faith proclamations. We just need to pray and move by faith. God will send us the people with financial resources. Let's have the mindset of a martyr, and we will accomplish this ministry. The twelve Israelite spies who were sent to examine the land of Canaan, but only Caleb and Joshua gave a faithful report. Those who did not believe that God was with them were already afraid of the Canaanites and said, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. All the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in, in their sight. Numbers 12, 13, 32, 33. However, Joshua and Caleb said, The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Numbers 14, 7-9 After the same expedition, ten faithless spies concluded that it was impossible to conquer the land. The other two faithful ones felt that though it might be impossible by man's strength alone, it would definitely be possible with God's presence. The ten faithless spies reported what was factual but not faithful. Joshua and Caleb reported what can happen with God's help. 
Regardless of the facts of the situation, God did not agree with the faithless ones. Instead, according to the number of days they spent spying out the land of Canaan, God repaid them with 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. He gave them one year for each of the 40 days. Out of the first generation Israelites that came out of Egypt, God allowed only Joshua and Caleb to enter into the land of Canaan. The results of standing with God by faith and standing with men by practical reasoning are very different. People often jump to negative conclusions even before trying anything. They have already excluded God from their decisions. They resort to the facts of the situation, not the faith that God requires. Anything is possible with God. Jesus asked his disciples, how many loaves do you have? Jesus was thinking about the way to, what to do with what they had, but the disciples were only thinking about how much they did not have. When they placed the little they had into the Lord's hands, God's provision happened. This has not happened much today. People get too defeated by their own negative thoughts because they do not entrust their work or ministry into the hands of the Lord. Only faithful Christians can help their pastor in different situations. For them, one plus one is not necessarily two, it can be ten. To the world, they look crazy. When the Israelites faced the Red Sea after they came out of Egypt, Moses said, The Lord will fight for us, and you shall hold your peace. Exodus 14:14. 14, 14. By this you shall know that the living God is among you. Joshua 3:10. Alpha. Also, God instructed Gideon to pick only 300 soldiers so that the so that rather than relying on the number of soldiers, they would rely on the strength of God. Faith allows God to work freely. Three types of church members. In my ministry, I have discovered three types of members in the church. For the purpose of description, let me resort to three different types of popular Korean edibles, chestnuts, persimmons, and dates. Thin thorns surround chestnuts. Once you peel the prickly skin, the chestnut can be accessed. Persimmons are plump-like fruits, orange in color and soft to the touch. It is so soft that once you hold it in your hands, it molds to the shape of your hand. Dates are small fruits that have a seed in the middle. They are delicious but annoying at times because of the seeds that have to be taken out. The chestnut members are very pessimistic. They immediately react to any proposals with adverse discontent. They are always critical. However, they can be supportive at the end when all goes well. The Persimmons members do not take any position. Whatever the pastor wants, they eventually mold into it. Though they are supportive, they do not take initiative on any issues. The date members often have a let's do it attitude and lead with courage. However, their weakness are often exposed at the execution stage. They do not go all the way to the end. All three types of people can be useful if they complement one another. The dates are really good at, at initiating projects. They are the ones to jump on them first. When it gets to the execution stage, the persimmons could take over and mold members to the demands of the projects. They are very submissive to the leadership of the church so that all the work can be done. The chestnuts will not follow until they see more progress. Thus, they will step in and help only when they see the positive results. The chestnut members judge all things with worldly, practical views. They do not easily accept the words of faith from others. Their entire faith consists of just attending Sunday services. They do not believe that faith can move mountains. When they pray, the chestnut members do not dare to pray for the impossible or the supernatural. If the number of chestnut members increases in the church, it will be very difficult for the pastor to lead his ministry. It would not be a big problem for the newly established church. Yet, when the size of the church grows, more of the chestnut members will exist and be a bigger burden to the pastor. For example, if there are 10 believers in the church and one of them is a chestnut member, then his influence is not that big. But if there are 10 and 100, then it starts to make a difference. When there are 1,000 among 10,000 members, the negative impact is even greater. The Holy Spirit himself appoints pastors to oversee the church. This means that the overseer must follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, not the people. As the size of ministry increases, will the pastor listen to God or to men, to the Holy Spirit's guidance or to man's logic? The Mind of the Holy Spirit Once a pastor starts to depend on his mind, 
on what is practical or reasonable, it is very difficult to go back to depending on the Holy Spirit. Faithless church members will often demand their pastor to use common sense or worldly trends to make important decisions. These people will only think about what makes sense in the world. Once the pastor yields to their demands, he loses his position as their shepherd and becomes their employee. The pastor will soon be more focused on pleasing the people rather than the Holy Spirit. The church did not hire the pastor, rather the Holy Spirit appointed him into that position. However, many pastors have devalued their position and even sought more compensation from the church for their performance. To the detriment of God's work, many pastors today are leaving the church because they are not paid enough. I have chosen to reject any wages from the church. As a pastor, if I follow what is on my mind, then my work can be much easier. My mind wants a comfortable ministry, or I only need to preach on the Lord's days and sufficiently use all the finances allotted for the pastor's use. On paper, my performance would be flawless. Interestingly enough, people are actually more focused on performance rather than the kingdom of God and the direction of the Holy Spirit. Every church budget has its own focus, strengths, and even weaknesses. Some church budgets are generally organized to efficiently manage the church without any fiscal problems. Thus, the money would be spent to make the church a comfortable place rather than a channel to expand God's kingdom. God's work does take resources. The more work opens up, the more urgency I feel to save and wisely use God's resources. Since there's no, there's so much work to be done for God's kingdom, I feel I can try to save money by cutting my usage and even working more diligently to maintain the church through other means. I often walk around the church to check if any lights are accidentally left on. I once repaired toilets myself in the church, one after another. Some members could not believe I was doing such work. They said to me, Pastor, you're the pastor of a big church now, and you are the face of the church. Others should take care of this. Please, don't do such things anymore. So I stopped concerning myself with the handiworks in the church. However, one church member recently came to me with an offering for helping for repairing toilets. He said that there was a lot of problems with the toilets. It looked like no one had taken care of them. It grieved me because this offering could have been used for other greater purpose. I saw that there was a difference when I didn't actively involve myself to maintain the church. Maintenance can easily be done with the finances of the church. However, the church was not set up by the Holy Spirit just to be maintained, but to expand to the ends of the earth. Pastoring the church by the Holy Spirit's guidance is my duty and life. The world does not recognize ministries that rely on the Holy Spirit. They seek for what they think is a socially, philosophically, economically, and politically acceptable church. It is easy to build a church that pleases the world, but my greatest concern is how I may truly rely on the Holy Spirit instead of my mind or what my flesh wants. This is the key to success or failure in the ministry, even in spiritual living. Being ready for the Holy Spirit. Abraham did not know where he was going when he first left his homeland. He had to depend on God's leading. Likewise, those who live by the Spirit must desire His leading at all times. John 3, 8 says, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Holy Spirit-led Christians rely on the Holy Spirit because they do not know from, from and to where they should go. On the other hand, those who depend on their mind often think that it is unnecessary to receive direction from God. They believe they already know what to do. A ministry based on calculations will have all the activities set for the coming year. This type of ministry, however, does not leave any room for a feeding of the 5,000 miracle. Of course, it is important to plan ahead. However, when the ministry is based on just a practical plan, people do not need to pray for God's supernatural intervention. Any emergency or crisis can hit the church. We need to possess the faith that is able to swiftly manage any situation. Whether there is a situation to feed the 5,000 or have nothing but water to serve in a wedding banquet, our faith must be ready. Though there might be a sudden command for a virgin to conceive a baby, our faith must be ready. 
we always need to be ready for the Holy Spirit. For our admonition. In order to receive the leading of the Holy Spirit, we need to learn how to preserve that, the fullness of the Holy Spirit in us. Thus Jesus and even Apostle Paul hammered this important ammunition. Do not grieve, quench, or oppose the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30, 1 Thessalonians 5.19, Matthew 12.32. This is so important that it is worthy of repetition. The Holy Spirit is sensitive. Many Christians ignore the Holy Spirit when they are not feeling up to it. Their reliance on the Holy Spirit depends on their whim. However, when they grieve or quench the Holy Spirit, it is pretty serious. For example, when Ananias held back part of the money from the sale of land, Peter said to him, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? Acts 5.3 Furthermore, when Ananias' wife, Sapphira, sided with her husband to keep part of the money from the land sales, Peter said, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Acts 5.9 The Holy Spirit knew very well that Ananias and Sapphira were lying. For the Holy Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. Thus, in this case, how could they survive when they bluntly ignored the keen insight of the Holy Spirit? Ananias and Sapphira were still saved by grace. They had already received what Jesus did on the cross. Yet, even for those who are saved, there will come a day when they will be judged according to the words of Jesus. He said, And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. John 12, 47 through 48. So just like in the parable of the wedding feast, those who do not have the proper garment will not enjoy the feast at the end. Also, just like how the wicked and lazy servant was bound and thrown out, those who are lazy with God's talents and gifts will not participate in the joy of their master. Matthew 22, 10 through 13 and 25, 14 through 30. The Holy Spirit knows all things, but Ananias and Sapphira ignored him. The couple thought that they had lied to the leaders, yet they were actually going against God's omniscience, Acts 5.4. Anyone can think, why did they die? Doesn't everyone lie? God took the lives of Ananias and Sapphira as a warning to let all believers know that lying to the Holy Spirit is very serious. Ananias and Sapphira did have faith. They were devoted enough to sell their land and give such an amount as offering to God. In spite of their initial efforts, God struck them because they thought, how would God know? This account in Acts 5 is not so widely used in sermons because of the severity of its outcome. Yet we need to learn that going against the Holy Spirit is a grave mistake. The book of Acts starts out with a great revival of the Holy Spirit. But in chapter 5, we cannot help but notice this account with their tragic deaths. Today, people who oppose and blaspheme the Holy Spirit are not struck down like Ananias and Sapphira. However, this account was included as an admonition so that we do not oppose or even grieve the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Matthew 12, 31-32 Every word spoken and every deed done against the Holy Spirit are permanently recorded. Disobeying versus Opposing and Blasphemy Disobeying, opposing, and blaspheming the Holy Spirit seem to be the same, but they have noticeable differences. Man disobeys the leading of the Holy Spirit because of his natural desires, his flesh, Galatians 5.17 says, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. Anyone can disobey because of the weakness of the flesh. However, opposing and blaspheming the Holy Spirit are not just disobedience. They are open rebellion towards the Holy Spirit by words or deeds. For example, let us say that a father tells his son, Let's plant a tree here. The son replies, 
I don't want to. It's too much of a hassle. In this case, the son has disobeyed his father. However, if the son breaks the budding young seedling that his father intends to plant or uproots the young trees that his father has already planted, he would be opposing and slandering his father. Similarly, there is a big difference between disobeying and opposing or blaspheming the Holy Spirit. When Jesus drove out demons, the Pharisees said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. Matthew 12, 24. This was blasphemy against the Holy Spirit because casting out a demons is only done by him. Matthew 12, 28. My ministry is constantly mocked by others because we reveal the identities of demons and cast them out. They believe that we are too extreme. They often pressure me to stop the healing and deliverance ministry. However, what we do at the Sul Sangrak Church is according to the words of the Lord Jesus. Those who mock us are actually opposing and blaspheming the work of the Holy Spirit. Actually, if every believer casts out demons and lays hands on the sick according to what the Lord has commanded, then the gospel would spread much faster than now. When believers start to oppose the work of the Holy Spirit, for example, casting out demons, the church is already lost to demons. This is clearly a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. When the Pharisees saw Jesus casting out demons, they actually they accused him of casting out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. Today, there are some who act like Pharisees. They deride the ministries that cast out demons in the name of Jesus and even accuse them of heresy. They are obviously blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Therefore, their sins will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Ananias and Sapphira's lives were not spared because they tried to deceive the Holy Spirit. How much worse will it be for those who blaspheme the works of the Holy Spirit? We should never judge other ministers or ministries. Keeping an open and humble mind will prevent any unintentional blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. What did Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, say when the priests and Sadducees were trying to kill the disciples of Jesus? He said, And now I say to you, Keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. Acts 5, 38 and 39. This is a very smart strategy. Intentionally or not, people who blaspheme the Holy Spirit cannot be used powerfully as in the book of Acts. Many of them do not realize that their words against pastors or ministries that partake in the works of the Holy Spirit are directly blaspheming Him. People who consistently oppose the Holy Spirit by words or deeds quench what God wants to do in their lives. If a marathon runner rests for 30 minutes during the race, no matter how hard he tries later, it will be impossible to close the gap with the runners ahead of him. Likewise, blasphemers will suffer much loss in spirituality and ministry. The Holy Spirit will simply not bless or use them. It is very important not to oppose or blaspheme the Holy Spirit. This is one of the most important teachings that every Christian should learn from the beginning of their spiritual lives. Christians should learn the works of the Holy Spirit and honor what He does in the church. However, many pastors are very detailed when teaching morals or ethics but incomplete in their teachings of the Holy Spirit. Many believers consider the violation of the Ten Commandments, i.e. do not steal or commit adultery, as horrendous sins, but treat blasphemy against the Holy Spirit rather lightly. The sin of breaking the law may be forgiving, but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit cannot be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Sin of Unfaithfulness The Bible explains another area where we must give an account to God at the end. It concerns the work entrusted to us. A master once entrusted his possessions to his servants and left his country. When the master returned and settled his accounts with them, the servant who had received one talent said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. Matthew 25, 24 and 25. The master rebuked his servant. You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. 
So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. Matthew 25, 26, and 27. Then he threw the servant out into outer darkness. Every believer has been given talents and duties in the church to serve God. We all have been saved and called to serve God. Thus, the Holy Spirit gives the talents to each individual to build God's kingdom. However, many Christians do not take God's work as a definite duty in their lives. Some say that they are too busy with their personal lives. However, repenting for all unfinished work does not bring back the opportunities lost. When we are unfaithful with God's work, the Holy Spirit will find someone else to do them. God's work cannot and will not suffer loss. Yet, the one who neglects God's work will have to give an account at the end. Though all other personal sins can be forgiven, there will be definite rewards for the faithful and loss for those who neglected God's work. Therefore, Hebrews 6, 4-8 says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it, and bears herbs useful to those by whom it is cultivated, receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. In 1 Corinthians 3, 12-15, it also says, Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will, be, will become clear, for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as by fire. Salvation means that we are saved from sins, but there are still consequences for ignoring our duties. Christ bore the cross for our sins, now we need to take up our own cross to fulfill the ministerial duties that the Holy Spirit has given us. Therefore, Jesus also said, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Matthew 16, 24. This definitely applies to pastors as well. Though a pastor has repented for his unfaithfulness in the past, the unaccomplished work and loss still remain. As a pastor, he will have to give an account for his work. Revelation 3.11 says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, so that no one may take your crown. To receive the crown, a marathon runner must run to the end without any rest. Otherwise, another runner can catch up to him and reach the finish line first. If another runner is right behind him, then he must strive to run faster to finish first. First and second place can change in a matter of seconds before the finish line. Likewise, saints should not slow down in their ministerial duties, but should be faithful to the end. Our faithfulness should even be to the point of death, so we may receive a crown in heaven. Revelation 2.10 Some people make impulsive decisions concerning God's work. They feel that they do not have to serve God. Yes, anybody can choose not to serve God. It is up to him. Yet each person must take the responsibility for the work that has been allotted to him. Let's say that a person came to Christ at an early age. He lives his life without serving God and one day he is convicted to serve him. Though he repents and serves passionately for the Lord, he will only be rewarded for the last year's worth of work. He will not suffer loss, he will still suffer loss for the years of his unfaithfulness to God. Each person's faithfulness to God will definitely be rewarded. However, his unfaithfulness will also be taken into account, and he will suffer loss. 1 Corinthians 3.15 Unfaithfulness cannot be forgiven. This might sound very stern and not gospel-like. However, it is the Holy Spirit that gives believers their position and duty, and they have to answer to Him. We must remember this again and again. There is no forgiveness when it comes to opposing or blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is omniscient and sensitive, all things are permanently recorded. There is great compensation for faithfulness in his work, but also a loss for not completing the task at hand. 
Some Christians try to justify their unfaithfulness with their diligence in prayer and Bible reading. Perhaps that is what Ananias and Sapphira thought. Since they had given to God a great offering, what harm would a little lie do? But God took away their souls at that moment. Somehow to God it was better to take them instead of seeing them continue to lie to themselves and to the Holy Spirit. It is possible that the verse, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that he may, his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord, has been accomplished in this case, 1 Corinthians 5.5. 5. Their faith in Jesus and offering to God will be rewarded. However, they would also receive retribution for lying against the Holy Spirit. Honoring the Holy Spirit We must have the desire to honor the Holy Spirit in all matters of faith. Even in our offerings, we must honor the Holy Spirit. When the offering basket is passed around, some believers hesitate to search for their wallets, looking for nothing but a dollar bill. They tend to hide it in their palms so that no one can see it as they put it in the basket. Already, there is unwillingness in their attitude. This kind of attitude can hardly receive God's blessing. Even when I give my offering to God, I push myself so that I am not giving emotionally. I pray, please give me your help when I need finances for your work. I do not want to fall because of money. Please help me. When my finances are tight, I become stingy at times. Once, I felt that my pledge to God for Thanksgiving offering was a bit too high and decided to change it. Then I realized that my initial decision was more of a genuine dedication to God. We must always stay with our original decision, despite whatever might arise and try to sway us. Ananias and Sapphira changed their original decision because they strayed away from the leading of the Holy Spirit. Even when we make pledges or give offerings, we must rely on the Holy Spirit so that we are not emotionally giving according to our circumstances. Every sermon that the pastor preaches must be given by the Holy Spirit. When Jesus preached, the Jews were amazed and asked, how does this man know letters, having never studied? John 7:15. Jesus answered, My doctrine is not mine, but he who sent me. John 7:16. One time, I was on my way to an unfamiliar location. There happened to be an information center nearby. The guide inside said he did not know how to get there either and advised me to go further down the road and check again. I took a chance and asked a small boy who gave me a detailed direction to where I needed to be. He brought me to the destination because he was so concerned that I might get lost. This little boy knew the way much better than the guide who was specially trained and paid to do the job. This is how the Holy Spirit leads and guides. He personally stays with us and shows us the way. Many times, pastors depend on homiletics to give beautiful sermons. However. Only the Holy Spirit can speak through us powerfully and lead people to repentance so that they may go boldly before God through Christ. The guidance of the Holy Spirit is strong upon those who do not oppose or blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Do not hinder the work of God in ministries nor go back on your responsibilities. Today, many people will not only oppose the Holy Spirit who work inside of them, but they also harshly criticize others who follow the Holy Spirit. When they rashly label others as heretics, they are unknowingly blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Although I feel like speaking out against people, I bite my tongue just in case I speak out against someone who does God's work. We will eventually come before the Lord's white throne and the Lord will then present a book dealing with all our deeds. Our works for God must outnumber our acts of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. Jesus did not care about how others treated him. He just continued to work according to the Father's will. However, the Holy Spirit can be limited. For example, I once visited a friend's home when I was young. His mother welcomed me warmly, but behind my back she scolded her son saying, there isn't anything to eat in the house. Why did you bring a friend home? After I heard these words, I felt bad for even drinking a glass of water in their home. Likewise, a guest's attitude can change according to the expression of the host. The Holy Spirit does not enter a place that is not his home. He does not invite us to his table until he feels comfortable. He is honored. If we treat the Holy Spirit as a guest, then he will never sit at the dinner table. The master of ceremony has to be the Holy Spirit. The one in charge must be him. 
We have to be the guests and the Holy Spirit must be the master in our body. We cannot say, this body is mine and I will allow the Lord to rest for one night. Wherever we are, we should think, this place is the Lord's. I am being invited to be here to do the Lord's business. Not, this is my place. If the Lord needs to use it, I can lend it for his use. Jesus warned that speaking against the Holy Spirit would not be forgiven. If so, acting against the Holy Spirit must be worse. The key to successful ministry and even spiritual life is to be under the Holy Spirit's guidance. In my early days as a pastor, I kept reciting John 3, 8. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. This is actually Christ's command to us. We need to be ready to follow wherever the Spirit goes. Our fundamental attitude towards the Holy Spirit must change. Our decision must be firm. We will never oppose or blaspheme the Holy Spirit from this day forward.